Welcome back to another episode of House of the Dragon. If there's a silver lining to be found by Lady Lena in her untimely death by dragon or childbirth, it's that she didn't have to go through the ordeal of her own funeral. Held at Driftmark, Lena's funeral was possibly the most awkward event in the history of Westeros so far, and that is counting Ranra and Laner's wedding banquet. At least, no one was killed by the time the Velarins were done with their grieving. King Viserys, Princess Ranra, and their respective entourages have traveled to the seat of House Valerian to mourn the passing of Lady Lena and offer their support to her family, Targaryen style. But not even a tragedy of this magnitude can force the members of the upper houses of Westeros to keep their beefs to themselves. While conducting the ceremony, Ser Veyman squeezes in a backhanded comment about the strength of Valerian blood, clearly directed at Ranra and her two older boys. This prompts Demon to let out a chuckle right in front of his dead wife's coffin, and it's all downhill from there. Even those that manage to keep up appearances aren't exactly at ease at the reception, and not just because death makes us all a little uncomfortable. Kids and adults alike have a hard time behaving at this moment of grief. At the grown-up's table, so to speak, Viserys' poor health is starting to take a toll on his mind as well as his body. As he leaves the reception for bed, he calls Queen Alicent by the name of his late first wife, Emma. This Freudian slip is most likely a result of seeing his younger brother become a widower. The king tries to take the opportunity to make amends with Demon, offering him a seat at the court, but the prince would rather stay at Pentos as a dragon for hire than accept his help. Meanwhile, Alicent and Ranra exchange pointed looks, and Lord Corlys despairs over his son's self-pity and his grandson's refusal to become Lord of Driftmark. Later, he and Rhaenys discuss the possibility of leaving the seat of House Valerian to Lena's eldest daughter, Bela. After all, as Rhaenys is quick to point out, it is pretty obvious to all that want to see it that Lucerys and Jacaris are not of Valerian blood. Rhaenys sees right through her husband's insistence that he's merely trying to give her back what was taken from her by setting his eyes on the Iron Throne, and accuses him of using his children to virtually become king by proxy. But the sea snake isn't having it, and his ambition becomes even clearer when he tells his wife that history doesn't remember blood, it remembers names. However, the real stars of Driftmark are not the adults, but the children. Even the reclusive Princess Helena has her chance to shine, chanting creepily to a spider right in the middle of Lena's post-funeral reception. Flabbergasted, Aegon complains to his younger brother about having to marry such a weird girl and sets off to find himself a drink and, with some luck, a woman to bed. He's found later in the evening, all but passed out on the sands beneath the castle, by a very pissed Otto Hightower, who has reclaimed his position as hand after the demise of Lord Lionel. Lord Otto drags his drunk grandson back into the castle, and the party is over for all but a handful of Targaryens who are still looking to get lucky. The luckiest of them all, at least for a split second, is Prince Aemond. Taking advantage of the fact that no one really seems to care about him, he ventures off to the beach to find a sleeping dragon without a master. In last episode, we learned that Aemon's dragon egg never hatched, and thus the young prince never bonded with a scaled pet. This makes him a constant target of bullying by both his older brother and his nephews. It is no wonder then, that upon finding an abandoned dragon at the beach, the princeling would try to command and ride it. Surprisingly, he succeeds. But Aemon's small victory is bittersweet, for the dragon he managed to tame wasn't a stray, but Lena's vagar. The prince is received back in the castle not by a cheering crowd impressed with his feat, but by Lucerys, Jacaris, and both of Lena's daughters, who are enraged with him for stealing their mother's dragon. Reyna, in particular, is seeing red, and not without reason. Having grown up without a dragon, just like Aemon, she was planning on claiming Vagar as her own. The kids trade insults and things get physical when Aemon suggests that Reyna should ride a pig with wings like the one Aegon, Jacaris, and Lucerys gave him in episode 6. The four cousins join forces to give the prince a beating and he fights them off with a level of strength and dexterity that only a boy bullied by his older brother is capable of displaying. But then Jack Ares pulls out a knife, and there's little Aemon can do to stop the blade from coming his way. After being called a bastard by his uncle, Lucerys takes his brother's knife and stabs Aemon right in the eye, rendering him forever scarred and partially blind. Now, if you've ever seen a group of rich, spoiled kids get into a particularly ugly fight, you know it isn't over until the parents get a taste of blood. Inside the castle, Everyone is screaming at everyone while the poor maester tries to work on Aemon's face. King Viserys is angry with his men for leaving the children unguarded and allowing such a thing to happen. Alicent is mad at Aegon, who was too pass out drunk to keep an eye on his baby brother. But it's when Ranra comes and that shit truly hits the fan. Demanding to know what happened, King Viserys learns that Aemon questioned the parentage of his grandsons. He asks Aemon who told him such terrible lies, and Aegon takes the fall for his mother claiming that everyone in the court knows that the boys are bastards. 
This leads to Viserys declaring that anyone that dares put his grandson's lineage into question from now on shall have their tongue cut off. He then demands the children put an end to their petty squabbles and apologize to one another. Everyone seems ready to do as they were told and call it a day, but, for Queen Alicent, saying sorry is not enough. Rightfully enraged by the fact that her son has just lost an eye, she demands that her husband do something about it. When he refuses, she decides to take matters into her own hands, and by matters, I mean the cat's paw dagger. Alicent pulls the blade right out of her husband's belt and jumps at Lucerys, ready to take out one of the boy's eyes as payback. Ranra places herself in front of her son, trying to fend off her former friend, but Alicent seems to have lost her ability to think clearly. Even Ser Kristen sounds reasonable in comparison as he refuses to obey Alicent's orders to severely maim one of Ranra's children. The queen comes to her senses only after drawing some of Ranra's blood, leaving the princess with a nasty scar on her arm. She steps back in shock, and Aemon tries to comfort her by saying that he at least got a dragon out of the whole thing. Still, the fight seems to have awakened something in Alicent, who is now ready to gather a group of allies not just to screw over Ranra, but also to strengthen her son's claim to the throne. What Alicent doesn't know is that Ranra also has something up her sleeve. Remember that there was more than just one Targaryen getting lucky after Lena's funeral? Well, Ranra and Demon finally had their moment together after that ill-fated trip to King's Landing's red light district. It was a delicate, beautifully shot sex scene, very different from the violence Game of Thrones became known for during its time on the air. But this romantic escapade initially seems to be leading to something a lot uglier when Ranra asks Demon to marry her and give her legitimate children so that her claim to the throne won't be as easily challenged. This can only happen if Laner dies. And for a while, it sure looks like that's what's going to happen, with Demon paying Laner's lover, Carl, to stage a duel with the Valerian Aaron off him. But surprise, surprise, it isn't Laner's body that Corlys and Rhaenys find burning in their fireplace, but some other poor lads. While his parents mourn him and his wife marries her uncle, Laner is on a boat with Carl, traveling somewhere way beyond the narrow sea, where he will hopefully live a long and happy life far away from all this Targaryen nonsense.